Okay, Jacob. So for those who didn't know you, can you like give us some introduction of yourself, a little bit about your background and your passion and where you come from? For sure. My name is uh, Jacob Rausch. Um, I started my education in the sports science landscape at the University of Tampa. I was there for five years where I did my undergraduate and graduate work. Um, I worked in a research laboratory where I got some exposure to different uh, studies looking at the effects of different you know, supplement interventions, nutrition interventions, and resistance training interventions. Um, at the University of Tampa, I also did a couple of different internships in the strength and conditioning setting and the physical therapy setting as well there. So that was sort of a, a well-rounded research and applied time for me. And then after that, I spent two years working as a performance scientist, um, as an intern, uh, roughly, for the, the New York Yankees, because they were also located in Tampa, Florida as well. And that was a, a really great experience, getting to see how a lot of these scientific concepts are applied in real world scenarios. And then after that, I spent the most recent four years at the uh, Peak Performance Project in Santa Barbara, California where I started as a strength and conditioning intern, but then sort of uh, moved over onto the biomechanics side where I was helping with assessing and interpreting data, but also um, you know, leading some of the research initiatives there as well. And then I also collected the data for my dissertation. And now I'm currently on week two of being at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, where I'm finishing up my uh, coursework for my dissertation so uh, nice. you know wide variety of experiences nice man nice so uh there's a little there's some question about like the research you did and also kind of want to ask some of like your, your experience when you're in p3 or like when you're in your young keys okay sure so so the first question would be like uh if it's like you gonna has like a let's say a basketball player come to you and is there anything you do before like you do the programming no matter like testing for swift testing or like movement screening definitely i think uh most uh practitioners would agree that before you try to decide what's the most appropriate screening or testing battery um, it's very important to have a, a detailed understanding of the movement characteristics and the physical demands of whatever sport that you're working for uh, or working with. So in the example of, of basketball from the, you know, we know that there's obviously these technical and tactical, tactical and cognitive components to it, but from the physical aspect, it's this sort of high intensity intermittent sports. And then there's a variety of motor demands that the athletes have to be prepare to execute at a high level and they have to, you know, obviously jump, accelerate, decelerate, shuffle and, and change direction. So having that, you know, understanding of what the athlete's going to be expected to do on court um, is definitely going to play a role in what I'm trying to measure from an assessment battery. Now, ideally you have an assessment that can give you some information into how an athlete may perform in each of these motor demands so if an athlete is, you know, below average in one of those areas, you can be more precise with your uh, training recommendations. Um, and when you're actually, when push comes to shove and it's building the testing battery, um, obviously I spent the last four years at P3 and I think they are, you know, leaders in the field because they, they do a good job. So a lot of my experiences with developing a testing battery um, comes from them. So just have to pay, pay homage there, but I think the first step that can often honestly get overlooked, especially in a, in a private setting, um, is starting by just understanding the athlete and who they are before they come to you. And this is, you know, at P3, we sit down and we go through a very detailed injury history because you'd be surprised, even though a lot of these guys are very young, when they come to you, they are fairly beat up. Sometimes they have, you know, traumatic injuries or sometimes they have these reoccurring injuries that can play a role into their movement screen and ultimately their performance output. So learning the athlete, um, learning who they are before they get to you, I think is going to help give you some more context for some other things to look out for in the movement screen. Um, after that, I think you can also get a lot of information just from a, a passive mobility screen. Um, here you can see if the athletes are 
hypermobile or restricted, or if they have any asymmetries. And a lot of times you can start to see the links throughout your testing battery where you'll see an injury and you'll see that injury present itself in the mobility screen and then in the movement strategy. So it just sort of gives you more overall context there as well. Um, so then once you have the injury history and the movement screen, now you can start to think about what physical tests may give me insights into the motor demands that these athletes are required to perform. And I think just very generally, um, you can think about some boxes you wanna check. And this is all under the context that if we're talking best case scenario uh, with technology you have available to you. So in the event that you have force plates and 3D motion capture, and then maybe we can scale back to some more practical means or maybe some areas where they might not have everything. But if you're thinking about what tests to include, I think, you know, an unloaded bilateral counter movement jump, a loaded counter movement jump, um, a depth jump, a squat jump, a lateral jump, and a single leg vertical jump. I think if you can incorporate each of these qualities and maybe select three to five metrics from each of these jumps, you can start to see just at least from a physical standpoint, if the athlete has any clear targets. And this could be on the force spectrum or the velocity spectrum, or this could be in the vertical plane or the lateral plane, or this could be from an asymmetry as well. And then if you have uh, 3D motion capture or movement data as well, then you can have you know a really complete picture here where you can see here's their force outputs. And then you can also see here's how their movement strategy may be relating to their force outputs as well. And then I think what's, you know, if developing strength and power is more commonly accepted in the field, I think what's still up for debate is the extent to which some of these movement strategies can predict risk of injury. Um, P3 has some current projects in the work where they're trying to relate movement strategies to some of these traumatic injuries. But even if you don't have, you know, a very high degree of confidence, you can look at some strategies and say that may cause complications down the road. So that's going to be something we develop as well. And then ultimately you, you finish this process, you have injury history, mobility screen, force outputs in a variety of different planes and movement strategies. And then you layer that on top of the awareness of what that athlete is going to be expected to do. And then you really have to take an individual approach to what's the most you know, relevant hierarchy of needs for this athlete to help them be, you know, the best athlete that they can be on the court. Um, also accounting for how much time you have with them as well. Cool. So, uh, usually as like, let's say if from my like personal background, usually we do like a counter movement jump and like a squat, squat jump. Why exactly is there like so many, like there's like loaded counter movement jump and not loaded counter movement jump, single leg jump, like and lateral jump, am I right? Why yeah. is there like so um, many jumps? So I think this is something that, you know, practitioners and strength coaches can debate for, for ages. And there's, a, I think you can kind of create arguments on both sides of it. On one hand, if you're limited in time and resources, the fewer the jumps and the more information you can glean from the jumps is is going to be more practical but then i actually saw i think it was a, a tweet thread or a thread on twitter i think his name's Eamon flanagan um i'm not sure if i pronounced that wrong i actually don't even know him personally but it seems like and when i read the thread i simultaneously felt attacked and inspired because as practitioners I think what we like to do is say, hey, here's a counter movement jump and here's 50 metrics I can take from the counter movement jump. And I can relate these 50 metrics to 50 different qualities. And what I gather from his test is instead of saying, hey, like here's the relationship between eccentric force and the counter movement jump to you know their ability to slow themselves down, what if you just take two or three metrics in the counter movement jump and just say, hey, here's a eccentric force, concentric force, and general power output. And then you can select a more specific test 
to measure a certain quality. So if you want to see something like reactive strength or how an athlete can actually tolerate load with a given, uh, with more force, then you can do something like a drop jump. Um, and then if you want to really isolate how the athlete can move without the influence of the stretch shortening cycle, then maybe you want to include something like a squat jump. And if you want to compare direct asymmetries, yes, it's important, I think, to look at bilateral asymmetries, but maybe unilateral asymmetries would be a more specific way to measure that target. So it's kind of, I think you can make a case for both, but I think the more specific and the less generalizing you have to do, I think the more confidence you can have that that given metric is actually measuring the quality that you're trying to get a deeper understanding of. Nice. Nice. So, uh, I know it's going to be hard for you and I'm going to put you in a hard situation, but can you like give us like some example, like with different tests, there's like different metrics. So it is give us some like, uh, what are like some of the metrics you're going to look on when it comes to like counter movement jump or like lateral jumps? For sure. Uh, I think you can think of two examples off the jump, but in the example that, that you provided, if we measure an athlete vertically in a bilateral counter movement jump, then we also have them perform a lateral counter movement jump. Um, so there are some comparisons that we can draw. Um, so in P3, historically, they've been doing and internally, they call it a skater jump for over a decade. And, and one of the things that they found is that just because an athlete may excel vertically doesn't necessarily mean that they can excel laterally. And oftentimes, practically, when you know you see receive a report from P3, you'll see their vertical plane performance outputs plotted on the y-axis and their lateral plane performance outputs plotted on the x-axis. And then when you look at these together, you can see your athletes in this top right quadrant who excel both vertically and laterally. Um, they're going to be your athletes who maybe they're clearly well developed in both planes, and maybe vertical force or lateral force production outputs is not a top target for them. Um, similarly, you have athletes in that sort of that bottom left quadrant where they uh, they may excel or they're they're below average in both. So in, you don't necessarily have to be incredibly specific and you can say, Hey, they need both vertical and lateral, but where having these two tests can be helpful, um, is in the, you know, the top left quadrant and also the bottom right quadrant. So in the example of the top left, you have your athletes who excel vertically, but who don't excel laterally. And in this instance, if you only perform the counter movement jump and you said, Hey, this athlete's jumping 28, 29 inches, clearly they express a sufficient amount of lower body power and we don't have to work on it. Um, you're missing that they're actually, yes, they're good vertically, but they're very poor laterally. And with the lateral demands of basketball, that could be a very key area that they need to work on. And then the inverse is true on sort of that bottom right quadrant as well, where here it, you know, the athlete excels laterally, which is great. They may be able to shuffle at a high level, but vertically they're significantly below average. So, by having both of these tests, um, I just think it gives you a more comprehensive view on an athlete's vertical and lateral force production outputs. Cool. But uh, why don't you guys like do things like uh, like uh, the NFL, like cone drill, that, that kind of stuff for like the, let's say, for lateral movement or lateral acceleration? Um, so are you talking about more specific field tests instead of generalizing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Movement? Um, I think, you know, ideally, and this is where I think the, the field is going to be going is if you want to measure an athlete's ability to change direction, you know, in game, um, you're going to want to measure them as specifically as possible. So where I think the field is going is you'll, you'll start to get more insights into their on court or their, you know, on field change of direction mechanics, but you're sort of limited when from an assessment standpoint currently in usually your, your space and the time with an athlete. Um, so oftentimes we'll get an athlete for say an hour um, and we can't necessarily put them through a variety of these tests. And 
we have some specific field tests, like we do do a lateral change of direction assessment that we think is, you know, relates to how an athlete can move on court. Um, but you also, you, as you get more general, and if you just do a three cone test and your only measurement is time, um, there's likely other factors that are give, you know, influencing that time instead of just their actual change of direction mechanics. So it's kind of like a, I don't know, an optimization where if you isolate something in a very specific lab environment, you can measure things at a very granular level. And if you go to the field test where you're just measuring something with a stopwatch, then there's other factors that could be contributing to that performance as well. But I agree with you that there's, you know, you shouldn't necessarily extrapolate how someone performs a specific, you know, test in a lab setting with the motor demand. Um, we just don't know exactly how much these two tests relate to one another. Cool. I'm so, not sure if that yeah. So is, so is that the main reason that uh, there's a paper like you guys launched it last year about like uh, the counter movement, the lateral counter movement jump with like the shuffle, right? Yeah. So I, I want I think you should have uh, Eric Leiter's Dorf on because this is sort of his baby. Um, so I don't want to spill all all the secrets here. But like I said before, P three has been studying lateral movement for a little over a decade. Um, and they've sort of seen anecdotally relationships between an athlete's relative lateral force outputs in this skater or lateral kind of movement jump and their effectiveness at shuffling laterally. So the specific test is, you know, they shuffle laterally for five meters, they change directions, and then they shuffle back for five meters. So 10, 10 meters in total. Um, and now internally, they're starting to try to understand those relationships um, a little more detailed and, and start to share them as well. So the idea behind this paper is they want it to start very practically. So at, at some point we want to look at all the kinetics, all the kinematics of the skater and some more, you know, detailed uh, insights into this actual change of direction instead of just time. But in the beginning, we just wanted to see, hey, is there a relationship or can outputs in a practical laboratory test that people can apply, um, do these outputs actually relate to a motor demand that basketball athletes have to do? And then specifically what we found in the paper is we stratified 140 professional and collegiate basketball players, and we found that athletes who were faster in this lateral uh, change of direction assessment demonstrated, I think, on average, about 8% more relative lateral force output um, in, the, in the skater movement. So clearly there's, there's some relationship here, but I also think we have to be our, you know, your, your own critic when, when you put out any research and the we performed a median split analysis, which is something that's very common in research. It's, you know, high or low or, or good or bad is how you may also see it. And it's not the most robust statistical technique, but it's it's one that's very practical. And I think what Eric can talk about if, if he comes on eventually is how we are trying to take more robust measures to determine these uh, relationships a little more precisely. Cool. So uh, when it comes to like lateral movement, like lateral shuffle, crossover, or like a lateral run, uh, can you like give us some like uh, example, like if a player comes to you, uh, how would you like build up their movement pattern or like, yeah, these kind of stuff? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of factors that can influence change of direction performance. And you have your physical parameters, like your eccentric strength, your reactive strength, your concentric strength, but then also your the technical factors as well, which is, you know, your body positioning and your trunk angle when you're actually performing these change of direction maneuvers and the, the degree to which you can unload your mass and the penultimate step. So internally, we actually have, you know, video recording of this shuffling assessment. So when we view an athlete, we sort of see side by side their force outputs and then their mechanics when they perform the movement. And then we try to, you know, factor in both where we say, okay, um, their force outputs 
are sufficient. You know, in the skater, they demonstrated they have significant, you know, ability to put force laterally, but mechanically, um, their trunk positioning was very off, or they didn't, you know, unload the penultimate leg sufficiently. Um, so maybe that athlete might need more, you know, technical considerations compared to physical considerations. And then I think you can apply a similar concept to how you would deal with improving performance in the vertical plane. It's, I think there's this spectrum of developing a solid, you know, strength and force foundation, and then gradually um, transitioning towards these more higher velocity movements where you can have, you know, some exercises like a lateral lunge that teach you just how to load and control force in this plane. Um, and then along the spectrum, you can start to do more ballistic movements like lateral skaters and resisted band slides and, and stuff of that nature where you're, you're training all the different physical qualities um, that may help an athlete change direction. And while also what our coaches do a very good job of, and you had Jack on already and, and, and John Flakes, our other performance coach um, in Santa Barbara. And there, when the athletes actually executing these movements in a training session, they'll coach the technical factors as well. So I think it's important to identify if you have the means to what physical factors may be limiting them, what technical factors may be limiting them, and then giving them gradual plyometrics in both of these areas to hopefully improve their ability to develop the quality and transfer it. Love that. I love that approach. So yeah, I can't take uh, any, uh, for most of the things I'm saying today, I've, I've learned from, from these guys, you know, I've learned from Jack, I've learned from John, I've learned from Eric and, and Trent's the other biomechanist, uh, in the Santa Barbara location. So a lot of this stuff is what, you know, P3 has known for a long time um, yeah. and what they, what they've been tweaking over the years. So that's, uh, that's where those insights are, are coming from. Love that. Love that. So that's so much for like a lateral movement. The next thing, the next thing I want to ask is about like, uh, also if a ba if it's a basketball player, let's say they want to like uh improve their like counter movement, counter movement jump or their like jumping ability, how was like your approach to like teach their like how to apply force to the ground or like how basically how to improve their jumps? Yeah, I think that's another um hot topic, and it, it's one that. I think anytime you're doing a testing battery, you try to find ways to relate to the athlete so they don't feel like a test subject and they can like genuinely feel like you're in their corner trying to help them. And talking about improving someone's jump height or their jump strategy is, is an easy way to relate to them. And, and it helps to get buy-in on the training side as well. Um, and I'm happy to give my insights into how I would approach it and how I think P3 has approached in the past, but before we even mention this specific outcome of improving jump height, I think when you look at what matters in sport as well, it's almost equally, if not more important, not just how high you jump, but how you can get there. So I think that's a, another quality that may have potentially even more practical relevance is, you know, if two athletes, this is the age old example, if, if two athletes can jump 20 inches, but it takes one athlete, you know, 0.9 seconds and another athlete 0.6 seconds, then suddenly that athlete who can produce force faster is going to be in a better position. Um, but internally, if you're just trying to optimize for jump height in the paper that we put out in 2020, we did a, a regression of a lot of different temporal, kinetic, and kinematic factors. And we tried to see which of these related to jump outputs um, at a full sample. And then we also did some close as well. And the two modifiable factors that demonstrated the strongest relationship with jump height were relative concentric force and knee extension velocity. And conceptually, this makes sense is if you look back at the initial kind of movement jump studies in the early 90s, I think it might, Vamos and, and colleagues were the ones that put this out. And they demonstrated that uh, the relationship between power in the counter movement jump with jump height, the R value is about 0.93. So we know that, you know, power is going to be important to determining jump height. And if you look at relative concentric force and knee extension velocity, those are, you know, to some degree, the subcomponents of power. So 
in any event, if you improve an athlete's force or their extension velocities, it's likely going to translate into an improved ability to jump high. But where things get interesting is, is trying to figure out in, with, in a specific athlete uh, what makes more sense to focus on. Um, and I think that's where I'm never going to have a very hard stance on. And it's one that I think is a conversation with the strength coach and the athlete as well. But I know just if you look at the literature as a whole, some of the most effective chronic training strategies to improve jump height are things like contrast training, where you have an athlete perform a heavy conditioning activity followed by a lighter exercise. Um, this combination of strength and power over time tends to improve jump, uh, jump outputs or heights more. But I do think it is important to first develop a sufficient strength foundation and then gradually work towards these higher velocity spectrums. But there's a lot of factors that go into it. The athlete's training history, how long you have them for. But yeah, I think that's a long-winded way of saying there's a variety of ways that you can improve jump height. But ultimately, it's going to be you know improving an athlete's force production and then you know velocity outputs as well. Cool. So I want to dive a little bit deeper into this. Uh, let's say when it comes like for like uh yeah when it comes like power output or like uh jump height, there's a lot of paper gonna discuss about like eccentric force or like rapid eccentric training. But why is it? Why are you guys like focusing or like saying it's like for like concentric force or like uh knee extension velocity? Um, I think there's a relationship between what occurs during the eccentric phase and these concentric outputs. And then when you're strictly looking at which metrics are more associated with jump height, then it's more, it's metrics that are more related to the concentric phase, but it's tough to, you know, the eccentric phase has a relationship on the concentric phase output. So inevitably you have to sort of look at both, if that makes sense. And then what and a subdivision of research has been, okay, what are potentially some motor demands that may relate to the qualities of this eccentric phase, you know, outside of jump height. So does breaking force or your eccentric rate of force development in the counter of a jump, does it relate to deceleration ability on court, you know, not necessarily thinking of counter movement jump uh, height. So you can, you know, they're all interconnected. And, and I think people are starting to parse out the extent to which one may affect the other or what these different outputs may influence. Nice, nice. I know, I know I put you in a hard position to answer that one. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, no, I, uh, it's a, it's a good question. And, and that's kind of what we determined, or we were trying to measure in the clustering paper is we wanted to see how different, um, how different movement strategies during the lowering phase ultimately influenced the outputs. And what we found there is that some athletes go through a less range as in stiff flexors, some athletes go through more range, and then some athletes just flex more at the hip. And ultimately, you can have a variety of movement strategies that can give you similar jump heights. But what's actually occurring during that eccentric phase kinematically may differ. Um, and then it also influences some of these outputs as well. So if you go through less range, you're typically going to have more force, greater force outputs, lower extension velocities. And the inverse is, is true as well. So um, if you're if a hyperflexor going through more range, lower force outputs, greater extension velocity. So I think that's one way in which you can use more of these like eccentric related kinematic variables to inform your training strategy. But um, it's it's a it's it's complex. I'm not sure if that if I've even remotely addressed your question. Yeah, of course, of course. I love that. I love that. So uh since since you brought up like cluster training that's like a, that's kind of like the main reason i like uh noticed you because like a few years a few years ago when i 
was like I just started in get into this industry I was a huge fan of like post activation potentiation and I noticed that you did a podcast with Jack shout out to him and you discussed a little bit about like post activation potentiation and I really enjoyed that so um not just for like increasing like a vertical jump for overall performance can like give us some of your thoughts on like the PAP. Yeah. I mean, just as a disclaimer, I'm, I'm not an expert on PAP by any means. Um, but I have had to, um, research it a little bit for my dissertation and it, it's something that I'm very interested in. So I can, you know, talk about it with you and, and, and sort of try to give you my current understanding of it. But there's a, there's a very good review paper by Blazevich that came out in 2019, where he really details the historical perspective of PAP, um, which is where most of my current knowledge is, is coming from that amongst some of the other seminal papers in the field as well. Um, so I'm happy to dive into it. But again, I'm not, uh, I'm not sitting here saying that I'm the the world's leading expert or any expert in PAP, but I do think it is relevant for people in every aspect of the industry to understand because it's a term that's commonly uh, utilized and, and spoke about, but it's often misinterpreted. And I think there's some things in the field that understanding it at the mechanistic level is not going to help you be a better practitioner where I, I think sometimes going too far into the weeds, you can start to lose the bigger picture. But understanding PAP, I think, is something that can ultimately help you better understand what factors can modify it. And then those factors are the ones that you can use in your training program. So I can sort of try to go back to the beginning and you can stop me um, anywhere along the way if something's okay. not making sense. No worries, no worries. Um, but I think initially uh, what they identified is before there was PAP, there was things like PTP. And so in these isolated muscle fibers where you have these involuntary contractions, so you stimulate it electrically, they noticed an increase in twitch force after. Um, and then through studying the mechanisms of this, they noticed that this increased twitch force after an involuntary contraction is due to an increased phosphorylation of the myosin light chain. And then they started to advance these studies and they went, they transitioned from involuntary electrical contractions to voluntary contractions. Um, and that's where PAP comes in. So PAP is typically measured where an, uh, an individual will do a maximum voluntary contraction for roughly 10 seconds. And then they measure the twitch force. Um, and the twitch force is key here and it can be traditionally measured in like an isokinetic dynamometer. And what they found is that mechanistically, again, it's due to this phosphorylation of the myosin light chain, but also from a time course effect, um, they found that the enhanced force outputs or the twitch response is typically evident within seconds, but then goes away within roughly 28 seconds with only a very minimal effect present by minute five. So to fall under this uh, umbrella of PAP, um, it has to be measuring twitch force, and then it's also uh, understanding the time course of effect as well. And now if you fast forward and you look into how these concepts are being applied into events like contrast training, typically an individual will perform a heavy conditioning activity they'll rest for a period of time and then they'll perform a lighter exercise or a target activity. And what the researchers have said is that you can't call this PAP for a couple of reasons. And one, you're not measuring twitch force. So you can't be confident that, that it's a similar mechanism. And two, the, the time course is, is very different. So they know PAP is effective immediately for this very short window of 28 seconds, where in these more practical scenarios, the effect of PAP might not start to pr uh, present itself in some cases until six minutes after the conditioning activity. So it's not to say that there isn't this super maximal output in some cases um, after conditioning activity. They're just saying that 
you can't call it PAP because it's likely something else. So in the review paper that I mentioned earlier, they started to call this PAPE, which is post-activation performance enhancement. And now with that being understood, now you can start to say, okay, big shot, thanks for giving us this historical perspective. How do we apply these concepts? What the researchers have identified is that now once you're looking in, in through this lens, there's one of three things that can happen after a conditioning activity is you can have increased force outputs, decreased force outputs, or maintain force outputs. And this is because of the fact that conditioning activities, yes, they may uh, augment potentiation, but they also result in fatigue. And it's this relationship between potentiation and fatigue that's going to determine, again, if you have increased, decreased, or maintained outputs. Uh, and there was a meta-analysis in 2013 that tried to identify the factors that can sort of um, influence the potentiation versus fatigue relationship. Um, the main ones were training experience, so training history, um, conditioning activity intensity, and then the rest interval between a conditioning activity and a voluntary activity. And I think it, it's intuitive and it makes sense that trained individuals typically tend to have a greater effect in the target activity than untrained individuals. And it's theorized that trained individuals uh, can yeah, have less fatigue from exercise and just have a better buffering of the metabolic byproducts associated with it. So trained athletes tend to have a greater effect. And then from an intensity standpoint, they showed that moderate intensity exercises had the greatest effect compared to high intensity and low intensity exercises. And this may be contrary to what you may expect. Um, but the theory here is that high intensity exercises may just result in a little more fatigue, making this uh, balance between fatigue and potentiation um, potentially skew a little more towards the fatigue side. And then rest intervals, they looked at short rest intervals from less than two minutes, moderate rest intervals from three to seven minutes, and then greater than seven minutes. And the optimal rest interval for inducing PAP or PAPE uh, was roughly this moderate threshold of, of three to seven minutes. So if you're just looking at sort of the aggregated findings from literature, you want to have a solid strength foundation to better you know, see the effects of PAP. So train individuals, moderate exercise intensity and moderate rest intervals. But now where the rubber meets the road practically is if if I walked into John or Jack and I'm the sports scientist in some organization and I put my finger up and I say, hey, your athletes need to rest seven minutes in between sets, they're going to tell me to get lost. And ultimately we know that um, Practically, the, the environment is not suited for these very long rest intervals. And it's also been shown that there's a large degree of intersubject variability in the amount of rest that's needed. So I think you can start to, to use some of the new school methods to identify the, you know, the minimum amount of rest needed for an individual. And from a tech standpoint, you could use you know, a tender unit or a gym aware where you can measure their velocity outputs in the target activity. And then you can find, okay, here's the minimum amount of rest that doesn't negatively impact their velocity in the secondary exercise. Or even one step more practically is you can use some concepts related to autoregulation. And this is what Jack and John tend to lean into is they'll tell the athlete like, Hey, you're going to do a, you know, a, trap bar deadlift and then you're going to do a hands on hips kind of movement jump you can take as much time in between these two as you want i don't want you to be fatigued when you're doing these jumps go for it um so i think those are some practical ways to apply the concepts of pape which differs from pap love that love that love that appreciate that man of course it uh it's um it's just interesting and inherently interesting. And it's, I've been having conversations with my advisor, Carlos U. Greenwich on it um, in the last couple of days, because we're preparing manuscripts from, from my project. And I think understanding the historical perspective of a lot of these concepts in strength and conditioning, um, it 
in, again, in, in some cases, I really do think it's worth it to understand where we are currently, how to apply things practically. And then for researchers, what factors do we have to control and manipulate to, you know, to study this, to help our practitioners more. So it's, it's, it's something I'm interested in and I enjoy talking about. Love that. I love that. I love that approach, man. So, uh, the next thing I want to ask is about like the velocity based training and your thoughts on like, how are you going to impl implement the velocity zones? Yeah. I mean, uh, again, you, you're picking some potentially polarizing topics and, um, I'm not sure what your current experience is with it. So I don't want to, you know, go over concepts that you're already well aware of, but I can just tell you from personally, my initial exposure to VBT was back in 2014 when I was at the University of Tampa. Um, Justin Thiel, the strength coach there at the time and who's still there, um, he was using it at a very high level where I walked into the gym and there was eight tendo units across the rack and all these baseball players are looking at their outputs. They're competing with one another. And I was like, what is going on here? Um, so just initially, just from a, a feedback standpoint, I think it's, it's a great tool. Um, and then together we ran a research project where we looked at some concepts like you're talking about and more prescribing specific velocity zones, um, which I think has its potentials, but also some, some factors that you definitely have to be aware of. Um, and so, you know, I've seen it be applied at in collegiate level and also at P3 as well. But again, this is something that there are people who are much more qualified to talk on the intricacies of VBT than myself. Um, I'm happy to give you my, you know, current understanding and use cases of it. But there was a, I think it was 2020, uh, Jonathan Weekly put out a paper in the strength and conditioning journal, um, um, along with a lot of the other references in the VBT space. Um, and they sort of talk about the continuum of adopting these VBT philosophies, where on one end of the spectrum, you have simply using it as a tool to enhance feedback. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have stuff like load velocity profiles, velocity cutoffs, um, and even assessment implications as well. But Getting back to your specific question on these velocity zones, I'm glad you asked that because that's one area that I think you have to be very careful on. Because I think initially when VBT came out, I'm, I'm envisioning this one figure that had it on one side, it was the velocity and on the other side, it was the relative intensity. So people were just going around and they were saying, you know, 0.7 meters per second may equate to, you know, 75% in athletes 1RM. So people were just sort of blanketly prescribing these uh, these zones, thinking that they're getting a similar intensity between athletes. So I think what there's a, a good paper by Baynard in 2017, where they clearly demonstrated that load velocity profiles are reliable within athletes, um, but not necessarily between athletes. So if I go through a load velocity profile, where if I start at, you know, 40% of my one RM and I go all the way up and I do two to three reps, you know, at roughly five different loads. If you bring me back tomorrow, 80% um, of my one RM is, is likely still going to fit into this velocity threshold. So if you give me a load velocity profile, then yes, you can prescribe speed zones relative to me. But if me and you go through this load velocity profile and you're stronger than me, you may have a, you know, at a higher intensity, um, you may have a, a higher ability to, to move it faster than me. So 0.8 seconds for you, um, meters per second, it may be a, a very different relative intensity compared to me. So I think that's one thing that um, people have to be very careful of is that you can't necessarily, you know, obviously on the ends of the spectrum, we know that there's a load velocity relationship and that they're going to relate, but but in the middle here, there's a lot of between athlete variability. So I think the, the best way to get the most accurate data here is to perform load velocity profiles on each of your athletes if you want to prescribe some of these zones. Um, granted, there's a lot of other applications of VBT outside of these uh, zone prescriptions, but 
And I'm not saying you can't just prescribe blanket zones if that's what you want to do, but I think you just have to know that it's there's a chance it's going to be a different intensity between athletes. Love that. So can you like uh walk us through like how to like build up in a athlete's like uh load velocity profiling? Yeah, I think in the um in the paper they recommend for your you no know, your free weight exercises. So something like a like if we're just using the back squat as an example. Um, start at 40% of your one RM. Um, and then, then you want to go up and then you can either do like a, a two-point method or roughly at five different loads, but you want to get, I think, roughly two to three reps, and there, you can do it a variety of ways, but say you want to get two to three reps at five different loads from 40% of your, your 1RM and, and then whatever you're comfortable with, however high you want to go. If you want to go up to 100% and get a single um, or stop at 85%. Um, what you can then have is you can uh, correlate, uh, you can do a regression on this, and then you can see the velocities at a given percentage of your 1RM. And then there's, there's two ways you can go about this now. Now you can start to apply um, speed zones instead of intensity. And what this may have as an advantage is, you know, your, your 1RM may fluctuate daily. Whereas if you prescribe um, just a, a speed zone relative to you, um, then that speed zone can meet you where you're at on this day. So say you want to do, you know, 0.7 meters per second. And the last time you did this exercise, um, you start at that similar load. But in each case, if say you're you're fatigued and you're at that load, your velocity is much lower. Um, then now you have this information and then you can lower the absolute load here to, to maintain that intensity that you were trying to prescribe. Um, and they can also account for the days that you're feeling good. If you, if you want to have your athlete train at 75% of their 1RM, you have the corresponding load and the velocity and you start them at the load they were at last time, but today you're feeling good and you're bumping it up, then you can start to so do these daily fluctuations depending on you know where you're at. Um, and then you can also use it as an assessment tool. So you have these you know five different loads that you did at the beginning of the intervention. You can test them throughout the intervention to see if your 1RM or your load velocity profile is changing. Then you can also compare your adaptations throughout this load velocity profile. So in certain instances, if you're, you know, your high force, your outputs aren't changing. If your velocity is near your, you know, close to your 1RM are the same. But if you look at this middle zone and you're able to move these lighter loads really faster, you know, I would say that's a positive adaptation that you wouldn't have been able to assess if you didn't do the profile. Um, and that's something that, um, practically speaking, John Flake implemented with some of our pre-draft athletes is it just gives you the ability to measure where adaptations are occurring with a little more precision. So I think um, those are two applications you can use it for. Love that, love that. And I I think I can't, I need I need to apologize for like picking these topics. I know it's tough, so I'm sorry about that. I I I do know it's tough to answer. So, but, uh, I think it's because the 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 first podcast you did with Jack. So I really enjoyed that. So I kind of want to ask that for like for a long time. So I'm sorry about that. And last thing, if there's like coaches or like therapists are interested in what we're talking about today where can they reach out to you um i'm i'm on instagram uh jacob uh underscore roush i'm on twitter uh at jt roush and then most of all my research can be found on researchgate if you search my name as well um currently i don't uh you know, I'm not an active tweeter. I'll, I'll share research papers that I find interesting, but I don't have, uh, or I try not to just, uh, you know, unsolicitedly share, share my advice here. Um, but those are, that's where you can find me. And, and in the future, I think as some of my dissertation starts to come out, I'll, I'll try to share some of the applications more. Um, but I just want to, uh, just sort of, uh, tie into what you're saying on the sort of polarizing topics here. Um, by no means do I think I'm the authority on any of these. And, and I tried to, 
um, you know, pay homage to the people who, you know, at P3, um, who set the foundation there and, and some of these researchers in the, the varying topics from PAP to VBT. Um, those are the authorities I'm just trying to understand it um, and apply it. And, you know, I, I don't think what I said is, is gospel. And I, I'm sure there's more applications and, and more uh, concerns that I didn't get to, but I appreciate you giving me the uh, your time of day just to chat. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, man. Appreciate that. I think people's going to love your experience. I, I, I hope so. Uh, it's, it's been a, They're it's been a long it. road. And I, I'd love to, you know, to share and, and help anyone I can. So yeah, thank you again for the opportunity. Appreciate it.